it's can, can we it's can we um it's not quite an off, like off ramp it's just like an access road to yeah. that point can we talk about education today and the elimination sure. of stakes yeah the so elimination I, of stakes the elimination of stakes okay. or risk or threat or discomfort gotcha. um i mean like i'm all for <clears throat> positive experiences i'm all for um healthy self esteem i'm all for um you know, avoidance of threats that, that would risk our health. And, and, but, you know, when we started in education, when we started you at Drexel, me at, at Pacific, it was a different world. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the student body was different. Um, the effort was, was very different, but what, something that I wonder, I'm not, com- I'm not committed to this idea, but this, this thought that I've been having for a while is that the internet and specifically like social media, things like that have really d- done a disservice to the students. And, and because it's been weaponized, I mean, you see when, when, when somebody, when a professor holds a student accountable whether that's let's grade honestly, whether that's let me give them a challenge, you know, whether that's any type of, of academic accountability, um, the students, you put yourself at great risk by doing that because the students can't just go on a campaign against you publicly. And then the whole world is like, oh, that per-, and you think you just say whatever. Right? There's, there's, no, there's nothing stopping the students from just destroying somebody for having an honest academic experience that, that presents challenges. And so I think a lot of professors live in fear. Um, and so what do we do in, in that situation? I think we just like cover the student's world in cotton balls. You know, like we, we, we like child proof a classroom um, so that students never get their self esteem, you know, scraped on like a totally normal edge that they need to be prepared for. And I just think that's such a disservice to the students. I think it really prevents maturation. I, th- I think it prevents students from growing into the qualities of adulthood that define an adult. <laughs> Gotcha. So it's I, sort of like a veil that sort of shields the outside world and yeah. all the risks and dangers that can come with it, right? Yeah, well, let's, let's yeah. call it like academic puberty. And, and yeah. you know, it's it's not like leptin and kispeptin and whatever that, that, put stu- that put like children into puberty. It's like stresses. It's environmental, social, you know, practical life stresses that develop um, the emotional maturity into adulthood. And I think we're just, we're cutting off those stresses and, and what like academic maturity, we're just like in, like, okay, can we just make this extreme for, <laughs> for sure, a second? Sure. In Italy, in like the late 16th century, um, you probably know where this is going, right? Opera singing little boys. They're not even 10 years old. I mean, we're like a seven, eight, nine years old. And this went through, at least through the 18th century. Um, they were castrating little little boys so they wouldn't hit biological puberty, uh, which means that their vocal, I don't care if you call it cords or folds or whatever, their, their, their vocal cords, that mass stays roughly the same, um, but the chest cavity expands and, and okay, you can produce these great treble uh, notes, but it is so cruel to deny an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old um, maturity to deny them an adulthood. And on a, on a less severe scale, I think it's cruel for, for professors to cotton ball classrooms and say, there's no threat of you failing. There's, there's no wrong answers here. Um, the tests aren't gonna be hard. Everybody passes. Mm. Um, we're denying them in a similar way, not in the anatomical way, but in a, in a physiological, emotional, chemical way, we are denying um, growth, emotional growth, emotional maturity, and like adulthood, uh, in a sense. And so I think there's cruelty there. I think the the most compassionate act we can have, because what are we as professors? We're trying to prepare people to succeed on their own, to succeed, to be able to have a mortgage on a house, to pay for their own kids' college or whatever, to the food yeah. bill, all of their, we're trying to prepare them for that. I think the most compassionate act is not self-defense, right, self-preservation on the professor's behalf of I don't want them to attack me online. I think the, the, the best thing, the most ethical thing you can do is present challenges um, so they have those stresses to trigger that version of puberty. And I just, it's not, it's, 
it's a battle that's hard to fight anymore because nobody wants it. Gotcha. You know, so admi just... College administrators don't want it because then the students might not pay tuition anymore. The parents certainly don't want it. I mean, I get phone calls from parents. I'm like, oh, uh, they don't know what FERP is. Right? Uh, and so there's nobody wants it. The students are up in arms. And it's like the professors are the only people who want this. Now, that's my perception. I'm not saying this is fact. Right. And it's not like and I'm wearing an ACSM shirt. Right. So I'm not saying like this is the, you know, like the the position of AC, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying this is my perception, um, experientially in the classroom and in conversation with other faculty members. Is it feels like we're withdrawing stakes, we're withdrawing um, challenges and 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 I don't know, emotional or academic threats. So so just to make sure to to summarize the point, I, I think to make sure to make sure that we're we're clear here. So the the people that want that you 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 mentioned want this sort of cotton balling of of the classroom or the academic experiences it, it's it's the fa it's the faculty that create the classes for it or so so my my impression again yeah, impression. not not an expert in this area yeah i just have a lot of experience in watching circumstances change sure. and in the changing structure the changing circumstances i see changing students um and because we're going to do as little as possible to maximize success again we're our brains are lazy with memory our bodies are lazy with sofas we're just lazy with aspirations and goals and so nobody is gonna like oh i went above and beyond yeah not really you, you, everybody sort of does if if there's like i need to work this hard to accomplish that thing you'll work exactly that hard <laughs> you know and then you come up with a new goal and work exactly that hard and there are exceptions but that's that tends to be a human trait and so um college is a business uh, if tuition dollars don't come in, what's propping it up? I mean, you're not going to have housing money coming in if you don't have students paying tuition. So it's like housing, uh, you know, meal plans or whatever. And, and, and you know, that's what's paying the bills here. And you have to have students paying tuition. If students are frustrated and upset with, with professors and they think circumstances are unfair, they're going to stop paying tuition. And so sure. I, I think there is administrative pressure. There's student pressure, there's student community pressure, meaning family members and mom and dad and whatever, um, providing pressure on, uh, pressure on the professors who are actually in control of the classroom. And I think most professors, me to a degree, cave and say, look, I, this isn't a battle I can fight anymore. I'm the only one fighting it. <laughs> you know, like nobody wants me to have a challenge. And so why am I still doing it? And so I still try to challenge as mm -hmm. much as I can, but but I think it's such, it's so catastrophic to student development to not because think think like an immune system, right. like how to take a mammal and put it in a clean room, no you know biological no germs, no germs you know no bacteria, yeah. nothing like that, and that's devastating. You know we need threats to develop, um, and, and and I think in the academy students need threat. these are critical years of emotional and academic development and and if they're like running into cotton balls they don't get the calluses right and they don't get those memories of mm -hmm. challenge you, you know why what are the stakes well why would i learn this stuff and so i think it does a disservice to the students i get the arguments of you know old people have been complaining about young people for as long as there have been old people and young people. Right. You know, I, there's a hundred million quotations that you can pull from books from the 16th or like Socrates or what you can pull, pull quotations about, about the elderly, um, you know, complaining about youth for eons. Um, but I do think there's a severity difference or a magnitude difference where people if you dismiss the complaint, I think that's one more way of, of fearing looking like a fool in the future. You know, like if people are afraid of um, the possibilities of disruption of AI, um, people are like, well, you know, everyone was terrified that the longbow would end the world. I mean, you, you can find quotations of like the longbow was invented and civilization is over. And so this is just one more thing in a long line of, you know, the bayoneted musket and, and 
you know, nukes and uh, is nothing's going to end the world. But like there are very drastic differences in magnitude uh, of these things. And when you see changes in education, mm -hmm. it's never changed like this before. Right. Um, and so maybe it'll amount to nothing and shortened attention spans of, of let's really take a deep dive into this material. If you want to know it, if you want to learn this material, let's, I mean, like when I'm talking about, um, hypertrophy by itself that topic th there's there's a class where i think i do eight consecutive lectures on hypertrophy and you know the, the right. signaling the anabolic signaling of it and those lectures are an hour 15 each and i do i think eight in a row i, I think it is um because it's complicated now could i do it in 30 seconds sure could i do it in five minutes yep could i do it in 10 minutes yep could i do it in an hour yep and and so i can i can tailor a message but if somebody's getting a degree in something now if we're if we're in a podcast and chatting about a topic if you're at a conference if you're in passing conversation i think um brief sound bites are the best thing for those contexts, for those settings. But I think in school, I do wonder if we still need to tax depth as opposed to, you know, here's everything you need to know about metabolism in 30 seconds. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, maybe I'm just old fashioned, you no, know, and, and I'm, uh, you know, my academic tendons are creaky and, and unwilling to have range of motion in, in, in some of these areas, that's entirely possible. And I think what you're doing with you know, how do I actually keep them engaged is very progressive. Um, but I just wonder how it's all going to play out because I have no yeah. idea. Thinking about, okay, what did I do? How did I enrich the lives of students in my communities, right? So that way they could be the next generation of healthcare professionals that are good representations because I had a small part in their life into mm -hmm. putting them on a track that was the path of least, that was not the path of least resistance, but rather was the that path, was the path of, of it, perfect resistance, exactly right. as much resistance. Because yeah, you don't want to overtrain them. You know, sure. you, you don't want to like, you know, you don't want sprains and strains. And I, you, what you want is the appropriate totally. academic load that's going to induce, you know, cognitive hypertrophy, let's call it. Cognitive hypertrophy, growth and development. You talked about students coming to you and yeah. really disclosing personal sensitive qualities about themselves if they don't feel like they belong. That says so much about you. Um, the students feel comfortable that they're not going to come in and feel judged. They're not going to come in and and expect that you're going to, you know, be disappointed in them and, and they're going to go cry. You know, it, it says so much about you that you have this inviting environment where you do hold up standards so that they know these are these are the th th this is how high the hurdle is don't trip on it you know you have to actually get over this if you want to get to districts you know um real quick and, just one thing just one thing i want to say that i really appreciate you saying that that means a lot to me because i don't think a lot of times we get that when those types of things do happen but by being the person that's strong and when so when times get tough you want to be the person that people rely on because they know you're the one that's going to get them over the hump, right? Type mm -hmm. of a thing versus yeah. this, is, I, I'm going to go to this person for advice because they're going to tell me what I want to hear. It's when someone is in a very difficult situation. I've had students in the past that have had issues with, um, you know, feeling belonging to the university and in, in, in all, all kinds of situations. And they come to me, I think, because they know that I'm going to give them what I hope to be, from my perspective, the right advice from my experiences. A compassionate it's not, truth. It's not only a compassionate truth. It's not going to be necessarily what they want to hear because they can go ask anybody else that is willing to put the cotton balls around the classroom and just right. tell them that they want to hear. No, I'm sure, you know, you have to validate that feeling and I'm sure there's something to it versus someone that'll actually tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a reflection of, hey, this is this is part of growing up. This is part of you know, going through some tough, tough times and you'll be better for it on the other end. But I didn't mean to, I really appreciate the compliment. It's, it's very nice of you. 